You're listening to Win Win, an entrepreneurial community with your host, Ben Wolf. And welcome to Win Win, an entrepreneurial community. I am Ben Wolf, your host as always. Please subscribe, leave a review. We're going to learn from our guest today, going into that topic of how to get the best results from your scorecard. Um, and so, yeah, after getting that, like subscribe, leave a review stuff out of the way, I have to say that uh, as an introductory uh, prefatory remarks on, on who, our, who our guest is today, he's the founder and CEO of a company whose name I love, Key Performance Integrators, K Key Performance Integrators, Integrators meaning COOs, Key Performance Integrators, the founder and CEO. You could tell by the KPI, Key Performance in Integrators, KPI initials. Uh, he's got a passion for scorecards and metrics. Uh, and that is our topic today. Uh, you can learn more about him at kpintegrators.com. Uh, and with that, I give you my guest today, Jeff Provost. Welcome, Jeff. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me, Ben. Really appreciate the opportunity to join you today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, so if you don't mind helping us out today with uh, just a quick context, a quick two-minute background into uh, how, how you got to be talking about, how, how you got to be talking about scorecards, how did you get to be doing what you're doing now? Like, Give us a quick two-minute history and background and context for what sure. we're talking about today. Sure. So I just started KPI at the beginning of this year, uh, and it's it's been a long journey to get to this point. So uh, I don't feel that old, but it I can officially say I've got over 20 years of operations and sales experience and kind of my, my corporate career. About a third of that time I spent in big publicly traded companies and, and really kind of learned how a big company operates, how you mm -hmm have the good division of labor, how you pick the right metrics so that you know that different areas of the business are performing and, and things like that. So that's where I kind of you know grew up, if you will. Um, but for the other two thirds of my career, I've spent that in more smaller entrepreneurial companies. And um, you know, oftentimes I, I find when I, I get into a new client uh, as a fractional COO or fractional integrator for a company that's running on EOS, um, you know, they they lack the the right measures and and discipline of you know what are those things that they should be tracking that are going to help them get on a path to achieve their goals. And those are the things that the big companies do really well. They've got you know teams of analysts and and they know all the right financial metrics and measures and levers that they can pull in order to to drive their results. And the small business owner really, really lacks that sophistication in a lot of mm -hmm. instances. And so part of why I do what I do is to kind of take some of that big company learning and, and process and all that stuff and, and help the, the entrepreneurial business owner, you know, that, that really has this great vision for their business. They know that it's capable of so much more and mm -hmm. they're just struggling to get to that proverbial next level. Right. Well, you, you know, you kind of preempted, you know, the next question I was going to ask you, which is obviously with a, naming your business, key performance integrators and KPIs and talking about metrics, obviously I was going to ask how you got into that, but I, you know, you answered that question already. Um, one question actually that just popped into my head, and I think I can predict what you're going to answer, but uh, that makes, that makes me think of is one of the things I've noticed in the companies I get involved in some of these small and mid-sized companies is I guess one of the reasons why we would think not to focus on metrics on the earlier side of things is that a more foundational problem usually is having the right people in the organization and having those right people, hopefully in the right positions and right people, right seats, as Jim Collins calls it on, on who should be on the bus, taking you toward whatever your destination is. Um, and so with some, sometimes those more fundamental things, and you might look at metrics as maybe a more advanced type of thing. So if people have that hesitation on focusing on metrics, what's your, what's your response to that? Uh, my response would be, do, do people understand what your expectations are and, and what good looks like? In a particular seat. So when you're looking at a, a person, you're looking at a team, you're looking at a function, um, have you really done a good job as a leader, as a manager of setting clear expectations? Do, right. do, you, 
your team members know how and what they need to do in order to meet your expectations and to uh, ensure that they're focused on the right things? Are the things that you have them focused on aligned with the goals of the company? And far too often, I find that there's a complete lack of clarity and you, you hire someone to do this thing because you are tired of doing it on your own and you know whatever. And, and you might delegate some tasks to them and, and things like that. And then you expect that they're going to perform that thing as you would have done it. And then you get frustrated that they're not. And yet you haven't really, you've, you've kind of transitioned some work to them, but you haven't really painted the clear picture right. of you know how how to how to excel how to thrive and i believe one of my fundamental beliefs is that people want to do a good job and in order to make sure that you're giving them the tools they need to good to do a good job you need to give them clarity and right. one of the ways to do that in my opinion is through the right mix of measures and metrics so data isn't the entire answer right it but it helps you kind of weed out the stories. So you might hire a fantastic salesperson who you know checks all the boxes, they're personable, they understand your product, your industry, they represent your brand well. And you might hear stories from them about this great prospect call and this deal's gonna close and it's gonna be awesome and whatever, but yet they're still not selling. And so is it is that it sounds a people familiar. problem? Yeah, exactly. Is, so is that a people problem? Is it a process problem? And if you only listen to the stories without the underlying data, then you've really only got half of the equation and, mm -hmm. and you're not you're unlikely to achieve results over the long term. Right. And so you, you know, can't you can't distinguish or tease out what really is an issue with the people. You right. might solve and say, oh, that's a people issue. Or, oh, this guy's not really a he does not really a salesperson who performs, right. you know, but that may not, be, that may or may not be the issue. And then unless exactly. you're looking at some compelling measurables, you can't distinguish what really is a people issue. And this is to even be solving the right issue. Mm -hmm. And, and sales is a great, you know, great kind of area of the business to focus, focus on from that perspective, but because sales is an outcome-based activity. So if you're selling, then no one really questions anything. It's like, oh, great, this person's selling, they're doing a great job, whatever. But if you're not selling, well, is it, why is that? Is it that, you know, is it an activity problem? Are you not putting in enough effort? You know, did you send an email and then say, well, I sent an email, but I never heard back. Well, did you call them? Did you text them? When was the last time you called or texted? When was the last time you emailed? What was the context of that email? So you, you've got to have a, the right balance of activity based measures to make mm -hmm. sure that people are following some process. You need a mm -hmm. process, then you need to make sure that people are following that process balanced with the right outcomes. So, you know, if you need to sell a million dollars, well, you know, you, you're going to need a lot more in your pipeline than a million dollars because you're probably not closing a hundred percent of the proposals that you send out. So right. if you're not building that pipeline over time, then you're probably not going to hit that goal, right? And so right. those are those are different ways that I think about the measure. So I think it's about clarity for the team. Mm -hmm. And when when it's clear how you're going to hold people accountable and what success looks like, then it takes a lot of the emotion out of it. And it takes, you know, the ability for people to tell you stories uh, off the table. All right. What are some examples or things that you've seen uh, for people who were not doing measurables. They were not doing mm -hmm. metrics. I mean, I want people to, who are listening to or watching this to be able to see themselves, you know, and, mm -hmm. and see their situations uh, where this is something that they, you know, maybe they should focus on. What does that look like? What are some things that you've seen happen or examples or stories or yeah, like what does I that think, look like? I think most of the businesses that I work with are, are measuring something, right? And it could be that, you know, once a quarter that they look at their financial statement and they see how much revenue they did or something like that. So most businesses are measuring something, right? The, the challenge more often is that they're not necessarily measuring the right things. And so if you're only tracking your revenue, for example, um, and your profit and, and whatever, then, you know, you're not really, you, you don't have the right operational metrics in place in order to make sure that you can predict whether or not you're going to achieve right. the desired It's a backward results. looking measure. Right, exactly. So it's, it's really about, you know, so more often I feel like what I see are companies that are tracking the outcomes 
as opposed to balancing you know, those outcomes, you still have to look at that stuff, but with those leading indicators and the activities that are going to drive those outcomes. So mm -hmm. for example, um, you know, I'm working with a, uh, a commercial painting company and uh, they've got about 100 employees and uh, they were tracking things like, you know, how many, how many billable hours they had in a week. And so, you know, 500, 2000, whatever the number is, right? So they were just tracking kind of the outcome. Here's how many billable hours they have. So is that good? They're doing that because they want to, you know, make sure that they've got productive people and things like that. And so we, we started talking about that, that particular outcome that they were tracking and what are the different levers that they can pull to have an impact? And is that good or is that bad? And so we ended up changing that and we tracked hours planned versus the actual hours that they worked mm -hmm. as a percentage. And so once we started doing that, we could start to see some trends. And we found that they were consistently lower on the actual hours than they were on their planned hours. So why is that? We start digging in and we find that we've got a problem with attendance. We've got a problem with people, uh, you know, no call, no show. They're not, they're scheduled to work. They don't show up. They don't call. Um, you know, so we start talking about that. This has been a problem for years right. and, you know, and it's kind of the, until, defeatist, until you like, looked at that measurable, right. They weren't pushing on addressing it. Exactly. And, and they kind of knew that it was a problem, but couldn't really put their finger on the pulse in terms of, you know, quantifying the impact of that problem. Right. And then they also had a bit of a defeatist attitude, like this has been a problem for years. There's nothing that we can really do to fix this thing. Right. And we just need to hire more people. And, and so we ended up coming mm -hmm. up with a very creative solution to this, which is uh, to create more awareness. So it's do some internal marketing. And we, we created a, a contest and a perfect attendance contest. And it doesn't mean that people can't be absent, but they have to follow the policy and they have to communicate. And every week of perfect attendance, they get a raffle ticket. And every month we're going to, you know, you can put your raffle ticket into a different bucket and you can get grocery gift cards, gas cards, work boots, like things that are meaningful to their team and their environment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's already having a, a major impact on the business The the team feels good about it. It's, they're not just kind of giving lip service, it's actions speak louder than words. So they're actually putting money behind this thing. They're educating mm -hmm. their team on why this thing is important. And that wouldn't have happened had we not started looking at that right. measure in that way. Right. 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 I'm interested to hear, I don't know if it's already, if it's far enough into the process, like, well, how did the measurables change? You know, meaning what did that, what did that percentage, how did it evolve? Yeah, we're still um, early on in that one, but it'll right. be, uh, it'll, you know, we've got now data that we can actually I'm track excited. and I'm like, benchmark. I'm, I'm excited. And I wish I interviewed you a month later. I could, I could yeah, ask you. Yeah, I know. Well, we <laughs> can come back. About that. That's fine. That's fine. But, um, what about, I guess, where have you seen, and I don't know, I don't know if this is duplicative with the last thing I was asking you about, but what are some like bad practices that people do with scorecarding or metrics? Um, I don't know, mistakes or I don't know if it makes things worse or if it just doesn't help or if it's misleading, but like, what are some mistakes that people can make with metrics that they are using? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think the common mistakes that I see are blind acceptance of performance, meaning like, you know, we have a target for something and we continually don't hit that target, but yet we don't do anything to address it. Right. We just kind of accept that, okay, well, I understand that we, we still don't have enough leads or we still aren't selling enough or we're still not hiring enough. And I can understand those things, but we're not getting to that next level of, you know, what are we going to do about it? So, um, you know, a scorecard from, from my perspective is kind of like the the check engine light in your car, you, you, they've got all of this technology and all of these different things that it Sensors could be. And, and, and your check engine light goes off and, and you might not have the wherewithal to, to go in and diagnose and fix that thing on your own, which is why like bringing in fractional executives to help in different areas can be so impactful to bring that kind of outside perspective and expertise. Right. But it's at least an indicator that this is something that's worth looking at and digging into. And I think, you know, for those that have measures and metrics, far too often, I feel like they don't take that next step of, of diagnosing the underlying problem. Um, right. So that... I do, I do, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen that and then done mm -hmm. that too. It's like this bigger mm -hmm. fish to fry, you feel. Absolutely. You just don't have the time and energy to go into this relative to something else. 
Yeah, um, exactly. But, you know, it's lovely to have metrics, but if you're not making decisions based on them, if they're not actionable, or if you're not, not just that they're not actionable, but if you're not taking, even if they are actionable, if you're not taking action, right. if you're not holding yourself and your team accountable to do something and, with that information, then what's the point? And one of the things that I, I find, and you tell me what your experience has been too, but, you know, it's, it's, you know, one end of the spectrum is very little in the way of metrics and measures. The other way is like complete overkill. We're tracking 35 different things. And so how do you like, how can you reasonably diagnose a problem if you're looking at all of these different metrics and measures, which ones are the most important? And so, you know, that's the other thing that I see, especially when, you know, a company that's getting started with entrepreneurial operating system, EOS, and, and, the scorecard is one of the foundational tools of EOS. And so they build one and then they end up with this laundry list of data and metrics, and then they don't know what to do with it. It's like, what do I, how do I even take How do you find that balance? Like, how do you know? I mean, you know, this is, there's there's a lot of people listening to or watching this that are not familiar with EOS specifically, but, you know, there's this line of thinking that, you know, typically it's five to 15 measurables, Mm -hmm somewhere around there for at the leadership level. And obviously each department gets into more weeds on their stuff, but how do you, how do you distinguish between what's like, you know, what's enough, but not too much, yeah. you know, and what's, and what's not too much. It's, it's a little bit of art and a little bit of science, right? So I do think that if you can be disciplined enough to keep it less is more, so keep it under 15 for sure. Um, and even if you're even at 15, that's still a lot of stuff, depending on the size of your team. So if you have, you know, seven members of the leadership team and each of them has two metrics that they're accountable for, then that's that's one thing. But if you've got a team of two or three people and you're tracking 15 things, then, you know, how do you really, you know, how are you really going to make a, a meaningful impact on any of these given things in any given time period, right? So you've really got to just start asking yourself, why am I tracking this thing? So what am I looking to achieve? And that's where if you start with what are the big goals of the organization? So whether that be revenue, whether that be, you know, how many customers or whether that be, you know, completing projects on time or hitting certain profit targets on projects or customer engagements or something like that, right? What are the big goals that you're trying to achieve? And, you know, typically you're going to have somewhere, you know, in that five to 10 goal range, right? And then what are those, what's that right balance of metrics that you need to track um, on a weekly basis that's going to ensure that you're on a path to achieving that goal? And that's where I think it's the art is in, you know, figuring out the right balance of, tracking some outcomes as well as tracking some indicators. So right. if I use that sales example again, you know, you could have someone making 500 calls a day and not selling anything. So if you're only tracking activity indicators, right? then you, you're not really, you know, you're going to end up surprised. You're going to end up disappointed that you're not, you know, getting the results that you want. If you're only tracking sales and you're either selling or you're not selling or whatever, and you're missing the activities, then so it, you need that balance. You need both. And, and so that's where, you know, for me, it, every, every kind of function, so marketing, sales, you know, HR, finance, operations, and whatever capacity that is, customer service, those different things, each of them should have, you know, at the, at the company level, you know, one, two, or three measures that they're accountable for. Right. Ones are right. So if you, if you, <clears throat> once you've broken down, <clears throat> excuse me, once you've broken down the business into however many core functions there are in the business, whether it's marketing, sales, one, two or three operational divisions, finance, what, you know, maybe marketing is separate, maybe sales is separate, maybe they're together, but whatever you've identified those major functions, I guess a rule of thumb, obviously not written in stone, maybe one to three metrics per major function of the business. Um, I guess one, one argument that's come up, or not argument or just like a justification for over- over metricing. I don't know if that's mm-hmm. probably not a word, but the, you know, is it people say like, well, if we look at this and we see it's either off track or on track, well, we're not going to know how to diagnose that in the meeting unless we have these other three metrics mm-hmm. that go into more weeds and details about what drives that, that roll up number. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 you know, 
if sales, uh, I mean, you know, I don't know. So the, the, you know, so the, so the question is, I don't know. How, so how do you distinguish between, I guess, or, you know, or the other side of the coin is, do you say, well, um, you know, really the metric is just there to raise the issue. It's just to raise mm-hmm. the alarm. And then we have to go and take separate steps or we may not have the information in the conversation, you know, when we're reviewing the metrics, but we have to go look it up. But like we, it's that check won't be able to look, we won't be able to look it up on the spot, mm-hmm. you know, but it's just there to raise the issue. Like, I don't know, but what's your, how do you approach this issue? So uh, typically, you know, in a, and this doesn't happen right away, it doesn't happen overnight, but in you know, the, the best run organizations that I've been a part of, we have the company level metrics and measures that we're tracking. And then if I, you know, the top one or two or whatever at the company level for a given department are the top one or two metrics at the department level. Right. But at the department level, there's right. seven other things right. that there's drive a whole, those two. Right. So, so that's maybe it, more of a function of not having strong departmental leadership and that's why oh, we feel like we have to overmanage at the higher level Correct. because of a deficiency in the in the well runness or the well the good management at the departmental level, right? Because right. the departmental again, head you, they should have a whole array of metrics that go into more detail than what they need at the leadership team level. Right. And if you don't have that, then you you're going to feel compelled to bring it up to the leadership team. That's a great that's a great point. Is that when you feel that compulsion to over metric at the leadership team level, it's a symptom that you don't have good leadership or at least not good management or not good way of running things at the departmental level. That's really what it's a symptom of. As a as the leader of the organization, you've really got to ask, do I have the right people in the right seats? Right. If they can't figure out the, the elements that make their their piece of the organization right. successful. Right. They should be able to tell me. If I say, why is then, this off track? They should know. They should have already reviewed the data. Right. And, and, and by why the way, if, if you're, you know, we'll continue to use sales. If your sales leader can't explain why we're not hitting our goal, there's a problem there. If they right. can't, you know, if they're not keeping their finger on the pulse within the sales organization of the right mix of quantity and quality and pipeline and feedback to marketing on leads and all of this stuff, then, then there's a problem there. Right. And so that doesn't, maybe that needs to elevate to the point of at the leadership level, you're talking about this thing as a team and trying to solve for it. If you've got the right person, they just need some help solving it. That's one thing, or you might just not have the right person. Right. Right. No, that's a great, it's a, that's a great point. There's so many, I, I've just I've observed more and more of these type of things where you have a problem with the leadership team level. It seems sticky. It seems hard to solve. And it's because good management hasn't been migrated down to a lower level below the leadership team. Yeah. And that's really that, that. And that's what it is. I'm saying this also with like issue resolution. Sometimes there's this like super detailed tactical issue resolution that people spend a lot of time on the leadership team level. And that's really stuff. And that's a symptom again of not having good management at the departmental level. Because if you had good management, good meetings, good metrics, good issue resolution at the team, at the at the departmental level, then there would be fewer things that would migrate up to the leadership team and the leadership team yeah. would be able to focus on higher order issues, more totally. impactful, bigger on the company issues rather than these little tactical things. And that's also, I'm just giving another example, but like another thing I've seen where these these issues that seem like a leadership team issue are actually, you know, triggers to make me think I should be asking a question about a department or a department leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And uh, have you ever read the book American Icon by Alan Mulally? No. What is that? No, it's a great book. Um, So Alan Mulally, he was the CEO of Ford back in the 2000s and kind of executed this huge turnaround at the time of the financial collapse and crisis in the US and everything. And so um, he describes Ford's losing billions of dollars and he assembles all of his top executives of all the divisions and departments and everything. And they, they go through this meeting and everyone's prepared to kind of give their metrics and their measures and, you know, he, he asks everyone to code everything green, yellow, red, green, good, yellow, there's an issue, you know, a little bit of an issue, red, we're off track. Lose, literally losing billions of dollars, everything's green, right? There's, everyone was afraid to, 
you know, to be transparent about what was actually happening in the business. Everyone was, you know, being political and protective and, and everything. And, you know, so he, he coined one of my favorite terms, the data will set you free, right? You, it's all about, back to your thing about people, like he had great people, they had the wrong data, they had the wrong mm -hmm. measures, because, you know, everyone could kind of manipulate it in such a way that it seemed like things were going great. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the ultimate result was they're losing billions of dollars. So how could everything be going <laughs> so great? Be, it doesn't make any sense. Something doesn't add up. And that's back to that point mm -hmm. about, you know, telling stories as opposed to using objective data to evaluate for yourself whether or not this thing is good or not. Right. So that's awesome, Luke. So I really appreciate that in terms of great lessons. I think everybody could take away from what we're, you know, what you're saying and teaching us here in terms of a good mix of outcome based measurables and activity or leading based measurables, you know. Uh, good, you know, at least a starting point rule of thumb to, 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 to have enough measurables, but not too many is maybe one mm -hmm. to three per major functional division of a business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talked about how sometimes issues with measurables and other things at the leadership team uh, can actually be symptoms of where the real issue is not the measurable or diagnosing particular tactical issues, but the real issue is the leader of a department or the management of the department. There's some work needed there again either just up leveling or just you know kind of up leveling the management system that the department is using or up leveling the, the manager himself or the leader themselves for their department or more may not be the wrong person yeah. um so and and it sometimes it is about you know in i know there's people that don't understand eos terms but you know that kind of diagnosis of a person uh through the lens of you know in eos they call it gwc do they get it do they want it and do they have the capacity to do it? So, you know, if you have a leader who gets it and wants it, but maybe they just don't have the capacity to identify the right measures. And they're so busy working, proverbial working in the business that they can't like pick their head up and just take a fresh look at things. And, you know, or, or maybe they've kind of grown up in that business and this is just the way that we've always done it. And, and they lack that fresh perspective. You know, that's where getting, you know, an outside person to come in and just take a look at things and help you build that capacity and capability within the team can be really beneficial. Right. Yeah. No fractional. We're, we're both fans of fractional yep. executive leadership for sure. Definitely. Yep. Um, yeah. Having someone who's done this before, they're not figuring it out. They don't have to reinvent the wheel like you'd have to do, you know, have it, you haven't done this before. People have done it before. You could bring them on the team, you know, three, six, 12, 18 months, you know, help get things into a transformational shape, into a better shape, and then, you know, turn it over, either find, you know, either find a replacement uh, for whatever position on the leadership team that person was holding on a fractional basis or, uh, or, you know, hire someone or level someone up from within. But yeah, the, a, a, a hugely powerful tool. Yeah. And, and I think it, you know, a lot of times people ask, well, do you need to have experience in this particular industry or business model or whatever? And, and so obviously sometimes there's no substitute for experience, but sometimes no, sometimes, you know, for example, um, you know, we just did a, a scorecard workshop with uh, an after school kids program uh, within the last couple of weeks. And they were tracking things like, you know, number of injuries that kids have. And again, they're tracking these outcome based things. Um, but through through COVID-19 and, and everything, they had to change the way that their uh, students were were being dropped off and picked up. They couldn't have people coming into the facility anymore. Mm -hmm. So now parents are driving up and, you know, and they they text when they get there and they're trying to get the kids out within five minutes and things like that. But one of the things that they realized is we were talking about their business and uh, talking about their measures, you know, you need to track injuries, that's important, but ultimately what they were lacking was interactions with the parents. And it was this aha moment for them where, oh my goodness, we got away from that. And we let the, the situation that was kind of thrust upon us just kind of impact that, but we got away from the most important thing, which is actually having, you know, conversations with parents and caregivers and things like that. So they set some goals for themselves of having, you know, 10 conversations a week and having no parent go more than 30 days without a personal mm -hmm. interaction. Wow. And they're making well, that nice a metrics. priority for their right. team. And so again, it's another early on one, so I can't tell you what the results are gonna be, but I'll tell you that that aha moment for them of like, 
you know, is the bathroom clean? Are there injuries? Is there whatever? Like those are all things that they need to do, but that should be at the department level, at the company level. It's about making sure that the kids are having a great time and how can they measure that? It's making sure that, you know, they've, they've grown through referrals. So if they're not having conversations with parents, what are they doing to get more referrals? How are they right. going to grow their program if they're not able to ask for, for that and things? So the most important thing that they realize is that they need to talk with their their families and right. and so you know getting that that perspective i've never run a child care business before right. or anything like right. that but you know going through that process and and talking about what's most important to them what are they looking to achieve and what are some different ways that they might want to think about that was really really impactful for them right awesome well I look, I really, really appreciate Jeff that you coming on, making the time to speak with us here. And thank you for sharing this. I hope it, I hope it gives actionable information people can use for, uh, for, for, for getting better, you know, getting more effective results from your scorecard, from your measurables. Again, you can learn more about Jeff Provost at kpintegrators.com and really appreciate you joining us. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate it. And we do have uh, we do have a whole piece on scorecards. We've got you know down free downloadable templates and examples of outcomes and activities and things like awesome. that. So you know, please check us out. And if we can ever be helpful in any way, don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah, reach out to Jeff. Yes, that's kpintegrators.com. Thank you, Jeff, and everybody else. We'll see you on the other side. Thanks. You're listening to Win Win, an entrepreneurial community with your host Ben Wolf.